There we go. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy EMS week. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are honored to have one of our early board members with us, Mark Peck, who's retired from the board and a lot of his EMS duties, but not entirely. Um, and we are very excited to uh, get all the lowdown on New York City EMS history and uh, hear what you've been up to since you've transitioned to your new roles. So I'm going to turn it over to Doc and Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am delighted to have as my guest and friend, Mark Peck, uh, originally from the city of New York, actually originally from a volunteer ambulance corps in Brooklyn. And I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about that in a minute. But Mark is a fascinating guy from the standpoint that he is a walking history of EMS in the city of New York. And that's really what I'm gonna to wanna to spend most of the time on tonight. So Mark, great to have you with us. Um, we'll be doing this for about 30 minutes and then you can go get a drink or whatever it is you're gonna do tonight. So tell me about your early days in EMS. Where did you start? I got started back when I was in college. I went to the State University of New York uh, at Stony Brook. And my second year there, my roommate went and said, listen, I belonged to the Campus Ambulance Corps. We were one of six collegiate-based ambulances uh, at the time. And he says, come on down. It's a good way to meet girls. And at that, I came down and that was the beginning of everything. Stony Brook found me, not only my career, uh, which wasn't what was intended <laughs> initially, uh, and my wife. So strange story. You know, I, I had been one of those kids that grew up on TV uh, you know, watching Rescue 8. Uh, grandfather used to bring me to the old firehouses in Brooklyn near his house. And that was kind of a ritual back in the 50s. Yeah. So I always kind of had a, an, an interest in that. But suddenly here I am and, you know, decided to stick with it. I went through my first EMT course there. Back then it was a 45 hour course yeah. uh, with the prerequisite that you had to have Red Cross Advanced First Aid where you got to practice all your bandaging right. skills. So, book. yeah, yeah. So with that, I started there and decided to take a leave of absence from school at one point uh, and started working for a private just for the summer. And from there, I said, well, let me see. I may stick with this for a while. So signed up with the city of New York as a motor vehicle operator. I was already an EMT, but they did not recognize outside training at that point. So there I was, the smart motor vehicle operator or the ambulance driver. And uh, that's where it all began. So, and that was when EMS in the city was being run by whom at that time? Uh, it was 1974. So we had been about four years into the switch over to the Health and Hospitals Corporation. Gotcha. Uh, EMS was its own division then, but it still was, uh, was answerable to the group that ran the municipal hospital system. So you went to the University Hospital in Staten Island to become a paramedic? No, no. Uh, went to Jacoby Hospital. Jacoby, okay. Yep. And when I was still BLS, I was working up in the Bronx for a while, and they had yep. the very first medic program, the pilot program that started in 74. It was just two units out of Jacoby, and they wanted to see if the concept worked, whether they wanted to go with it. So, you know, I knew most of the medics who, you know, who were working back then. One of them said, look, they're going to start the program up sooner or later. Really, you know, you should stick around, get into it. And in 75, they finally announced they had gotten grant money to start running it. HHC said, you know, we, we want to go with it. And I got into the second paramedic class that the city of New York ran. Yeah. Well, that was like a lot of programs in that period of time because it was the Emergency Medical Services Systems Act of 1973 money. Yep. Everybody was going after grants to set up ALS programs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, the expansion was, was a whole tale in itself of strange things and, and how it all went. Um, so we graduated in December of 77, and we opened up the first paramedic unit in Brooklyn at Kings County. 
And it was a learning experience. Half the week, I worked with a senior partner, one of the Jacoby medics, and they split up. Unhappily, unfortunately, they like their home in the Bronx. So there's one guy who's stuck in Brooklyn. And the other half of the week, I work with somebody from my class. So if you can imagine the panic and the lack of experience as we're sitting there some nights going, Shh, what do you think we should do? And we'd be <laughs> sitting there huddling in the corner, coming up with a game plan to make sure we agreed. What do you think this is? Um, there was no telemetry radio for us when we graduated. Yep. Uh, the Jacoby system had it. They hadn't put the radio system completely together yet. So the days that I worked with my senior partner, he was medical control for all the options. He had the final word. On the days that I worked with my junior partner, the guy from my class, standing orders and transport, no matter what. <laughs> so... And if you couldn't figure out what was going on, BLS and transport. There you go. So. You know, um, I got to admit, you're not the only one that's been there and done that. Uh, in the yeah. early days of paramedics, there were many times where you only needed one medic in the bus, but there were two, sometimes three, because we weren't exactly sure what we were getting into. Well, New York has managed to hold on to the two paramedic requirement. Yeah. I still think it's a, a better idea the last 19 years I've been working in a system that only uses one medic as the basic, you know, uh, standard. You, some days you might get a second medic, but it made it a lot more efficient on, on truly emerging calls. Sure. And it was, there was more job satisfaction. You also got to keep in mind that New York City was a two tier system. Yeah. So you had, you know, we didn't respond to the injuries, the minor auto accidents, the sick calls like we do. You know, in the one tier, you know, you're the only ambulance for the, you know, 20 minutes surrounding you. So we got to kind of hone in uh, on, on trying to find the, the legitimate ALS calls. And we did a lot. We used to chase calls all the time. You know, we'd get there. If it didn't require medics, then we'd turf it off to the BLS truck to transport. And we'd go available and go do something else. So yeah. it wasn't unusual in, 12, in, in eight hours to do 12 calls. You yeah. Know? And that's something we were chatting about earlier is that unless you've been in the city of New York operating either as a firefighter or a medic, there is no way you can imagine the volume of calls that people respond to. Uh, it's unlike any other system I've ever messed with. I mean, when I left, they, they had, I think it was 2 million calls a year. Yeah. We used to finish the night with about 3,000 calls having gone through the system in the last 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. it's incredible. When COVID hit, they doubled that. Yeah. Yeah, just incredible. Okay, now, yeah. because you are this walking history book, I want you to take us back to the beginning of EMS in the city of New York and how it got from where it was at that time with Bellevue in 1869 to how it got to where it is today. So let's start, first of all, tell me about how Bellevue got started in the ambulance business, so to speak. Uh Dr. Dalton, who was a former Civil War physician, had been tasked during the war with putting together a military ambulance system. Um, so he kind of came with that background. And when he got to New York, I think they took him in as like one of the sanitary engineer. Back then, they had very strange titles, but, but evidently, uh, health concerns, sanitation, prevention of disease, were a lot of what the, the uh, municipal health people were concerned about. And he brought the idea that, you know, we can form a municipal ambulance service. So they started at Bellevue. Um, it went out with, with just a where, few years. Where is, for those that don't know, where is Bellevue located? Okay, Bellevue is one of the earliest and, and still remains one of the premier hospitals uh, in the New York City system. Um, it's on 23rd Street. East 23rd by the river. Uh, there have been several iterations of the buildings. And of course the campus just keeps growing and growing. Uh, it has become uh, our first re uh, replant center, trauma center, poison specialty, uh, a host of other, other, other specialties over the years, you know, especially now when everything is categorized. Um, and it was a source of learning because it was also associated with a number of the medical schools right. in Manhattan. 
uh, and one of their residency programs. So it's always been a teaching institution. It was kind of a very uh, likely spot for the ambulance service. Well, as the city of New York started to expand, and this was how I kind of got into my quest on EMS, uh, I started to look at, well, how has the rest of the system grown? Manhattan and the Bronx were all that was, uh, they were the city of New York. Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island were not yet part of the city. Right. So I started looking at what the city of Brooklyn was doing uh, back then. And also in the 1870s, their health department was also starting to say, we need to do something better. And they commissioned the first ambulances in the city of Brooklyn. And that's kind of what happened among a lot of the, hit, the, the hospitals. Now, Bellevue was part of a, a small consortium. It was Bellevue and allied hospitals that grew uh, of some of the other municipals. You had Harlem Hospital in there, Metropolitan, uh, I think ultimately at one point. I forget the year that each of them kind of joined. And then there were the private hospitals like New York Hospital. Um, so they each had their own, you know, ambulance services and the idea just kind of grew and slowly the people that were in the municipal system started to organize. Uh, the hospital system itself was was upgraded to uh, being run by a new department of hospitals, which kind of consolidated a, a supervision of it all. And with that, each of the hospitals that had independent ambulance services started to come closer together into its own uh, organization. Um, they had a, a board of ambulance uh, still in the early years where the police department was the one that actually coordinated everything. Uh, you know, if you needed the ambulance, you went and you found the beat cop and he would call the station, yep. telegraph, depending yep. on how early it was. Um, and that was how the ambulance was summoned. They had to kind of verify that they needed an ambulance. So it wasn't a speedy process by any means. Um, let's see, from there, where did it go? All right, so we're under the Department of Hospitals and that lasted till about 1969. Um, at which point the municipal system was taken over by a newly formed independent organization uh, under a corporate health and hospitals corporation. And they wanted to pull it away from some of the direct city uh, politics and to get some other funding. And EMS became its own division under that, basically on equal with a hospital like Harlem Hospital, Coney Island Hospital, you had the EMS division. So they're the ones that inherited everything from the Department of Hospitals and here we are today. And then in 96, Fidney took it over, right? Yes, yes, kicking and screaming, I might add. <laughs> they were not the favored group to take us over. Um, I will tell you outright, uh, it almost came to an outright revolt. The fire department at that point, the, the, the basic engine company, ladder companies, they didn't do first response uh, like right. they do in other areas. They really didn't have a lot of interest in EMS work. There wasn't that kind of coordination or on-scene cooperation. Um, that you see today and that you've seen in a long time in other systems. So these guys did not want to have anything to do with first responder duties. And even that pilot program in 96, I think it was, uh, had a lot of controversy to it. And it was a really big issue of growing pains. And it still isn't the perfect system, but it's absolutely, absolutely improved. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting you mentioned that they didn't respond to that kind of stuff. But back in the days that we were talking about earlier, which were just call boxes, mm -hmm. they didn't know what they were responding to until they got there. No. So why don't you talk about that just a minute? How did New York City, back in the days of the pull the box thing, how did the response take place for most neighborhoods? All right. If if you if you pulled the fire alarm box, I mean let's let's say 1960, all right. All it was was a pull alarm, you know, no digital, no voice, nothing. Um, if you did that, all they did was send the engine company, whatever was on, you know, right. listed for response to a box at that particular location. Yeah. So depending on the architecture, you know, it might be one engine or it might be, you know, the ladder going with it. It might be a number of companies. Um, and if they had no other information, they waited until the first company got on scene, gave a report, 
and either escalated it or called for a specialty response. Yeah, the dispatch system back in those days in the city of New York was like a telegraph that went into each engine house or, or truck company. Mm -hmm. and it would be ding, 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 and a paper tape would come out and you would know whether or not that was an alarm for you. And then a predetermined number of pieces of fire equipment would respond mm -hmm. because it was that particular box, that response for that box. It wasn't until they upgraded to the voice alarm system that you had any communications yep. uh, with yep. an idea. Interesting. But most of yeah. the calls for, for, for service came in by telephone. Yeah. People would call uh, either the operator in the early days and they would put you through. Um, NYPD had a, a normal, num uh, normal telephone number that was on the back of every RMP uh, okay. that people learned to call. This was your call for emergencies. So from there, they would then request the ambulance. Um, and then ultimately, when the 911 system went in, now you had all three groups at least coming into a common communication. Sure. sure. Okay, now take me back to Bellevue. How did, what was their original ambulance service like? All right, we only have pictures. We, we have stories of it. Um, if you go back and, and read some of the stuff, like um, the story of Dr. Dunning, who was the first female ambulance surgeon in the city, probably in the nation. Uh, she was just south of them at Gouverneur Hospital. So she would be transporting patients up to Bellevue at times. Yep. Um, it was horse drawn, you know? Horse drawn, and, but wait, you mentioned something. Pivotal. Yeah. You mentioned ambulance surgeon. Oh, there were no yeah. EMTs or paramedics at that time. No, no, no. Well, well, basically, when, when you came out of medical school, you were required to do uh, a rotation on the ambulance. You were the ambulance surgeon. And right. they gave you a little hat and maybe 15 minutes of, of orientation. And the brand new doc had the bag, you know, yeah. with some drugs. And they were sent out there to make a decision of, you know, you either treated it in the field and it was done with, or you brought it back to the hospital. Right. So the ambulance surgeon was the title of the doc assigned to the ambulance with the teamster. The right. teamster who had no medical training. I mean, the the equipment was rudimentary. It was a number of, you know, drugs, some some narcotic painkillers, childbirth kit, a couple of wooden splints, and that was pretty much all you got. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the teamster, and that's interesting because it was horses for a long time. Uh, it was, it was horses. A number of places, like in Brooklyn, the ambulance service started at Long Island College Hospital, which was um, downtown. And Brooklyn was not the area that you consider Brooklyn now. It was only the, maybe the northern third of it. Um, so what they did was they took the that doctor was, from that Long was, That was back when it was the city of Brooklyn, right? Yes, that was back when yeah, it was the city of Brooklyn. That's different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so when they finally decided to go with it, they hired uh, a, a, a stable and the Teamsters were provided by the stable and the horse, which was several blocks in the hospital. Um, and then the physician was the doctor from the hospital who was you know, the lower level physician, new guy, that they designated for that particular week. Yep. You know? And he went out and, or she went out and, and responded. So, so the Teamster would come with the ambulance and pick up the surgeon. The yeah. Surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. And depending on where you were, I mean, a lot of the hospitals ultimately had their own stables built nearby. If you ever watch the TV show, The Nick, you know, you'll see that kind of thing where the stable was, you know, like yeah. 100 feet away from where the hospital was, which, you know, I don't know exactly where Bellevue stables were for certain because there were so many changes that we have of photographs. Um, I mean, they had a fleet of, I think one photo of horse drawings was close to 15 units. Wow. So, you know, beautiful wow. photo, but we don't know, you know, what year and how, you know, how many of them were in service yeah. at any time. So. Very cool. Yeah. So then we move out of the horse drawn wagons with the ambulance surgeons. Okay. And we move into pre World War One. Where we start to have motorized ambulances. Yep, about 1920 or so. How did the system evolve in New York at that time? Uh, well, at that point, there was still the the, the responsibility was head headed by the police department for coordination. 
uh, they pretty much made the, the rules, the, uh, the designated response areas. Um, and there was a board, I think it was, what the name of it was something like the Board of Ambulance Supervisors. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm totally forgetting the original, but there, I've seen certificates of them going out to, to physicians they've credentialed. Um, so at that point, you know, the ambulances basically were coordinated by the police department. Um, so were police officers driving the ambulances in those days? No, no, they were just the ones that would verify that an ambulance was needed and they would okay. te telegraph in or call in once the phones were in and okay. request the unit you know, at the appropriate hospital. Cool. They would telegraph terminals in the hospitals where you would, you know, receive your call. Similar to the fire stations back in the day. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. pretty yeah. much. It was a crude system, but that's modern for yeah. its time. Well, now, the World War One came along, um, Fort Riley, Kansas, flu, flu, pandemic of 1918, what impact did that have on EMS in the city of New York? Do you, have you taken a look at that at all, Mark? We haven't had much in the way of documentation on it. I, I'm assuming it probably was <laughs> was somewhat of the panics that you're seeing today with COVID. Um, I don't know how the ambulances ran, what they did uh, as far as the contagion, whether they, uh, they isolated these people out. I, there's just so little written on it. I can't really tell you. So, okay, so closer to modern day, you spent 22 years as a paramedic in the city of New York. Okay. Tell me about that experience. Actually, it was 32 years. So 32. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was tremendous growth. I mean, we started out with, you know, one, with my class, we had, uh, I think four or five additional hospitals that got a paramedic unit. And you had that one unit that covered a huge area. Yeah. Uh, and then each six months, eight months, a new class would graduate and they would start the expansion, start bringing in new, new, you know, new stations, uh, new ALS units. They had more people to train, obviously. And the training was, was just full steam ahead at that point. You know, they were putting out two classes a year in the beginning. It rose to three or four. Training sites changed. I think after class 11, Jacoby no longer was doing it. But we also had a group at Bellevue Hospital that was doing training. So the two of them were running simultaneously during that last year. Um, you started to see the voluntary hospitals in the system. For those that don't know, it's not volunteer. The way that they've looked at it is the private hospitals nonprofit hospitals are called the voluntary system. Um, and they also ran ambulances, Presbyterian Hospital and, yeah. and up in Manhattan was, was one that was there from the very beginning, New York Hospital. So they, uh, they also started doing training for, for paramedics. And you started to get more people graduating, more units coming in, and uh, it went from there. And, you know, it wasn't until the fire department kind of changed the whole dynamic, uh, some good, some bad. It, they, they did not like to rely on the learning curve that we had already gone through on some areas like locating units, methods of dispatch. But, you know, we, we've reached the point where we are now where a lot of those problems no longer exist. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when I talk to young EMS people, I said, if you ever want to go to a couple of places, I said, if you want to see what a real emergency department looks like when it's flat out all the time, go mm -hmm. take a look at Bellevue Hospital in New York. Yeah. And I said, if you want to find out how to take care of kids, go to some place like Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and just spend some time there. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they asked, well, how could I do that? Well, it's amazing how receptive most of these hospitals are to let young medics in training poke around and see what goes on. Um, that's how I ended up at CHOP in Philadelphia because I was doing an ACLS instructor class with the senior fellow in pediatric emergency medicine, D. Hodge. And I said, you know, kids scare the crap out of me. I work in a re rural system. I rarely see kids. I need to get exposure. He said, come on down. So I spent a number of weekends there and saw two to 300 kids a weekend. Then it was just they're just another patient, you know? 
Well, Bellevue. it was. Tell me about the Bellevue ER. I know you've been in there. Oh yeah. Well, during the early years, because I started in Lower Manhattan with the city. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's grown and grown and grown. I don't think there's anything that you can find that they haven't handled. Um, they are one of the sites for a number of uh, medevacs in the city. Originally, it was the only site. You know, if you were going to fly somebody, you you would do it because you don't really have landing facilities at most of the hospitals. There's only a couple of them now that still have their own. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was just a walking inventory of every medical condition. And that's why, you know, especially in the early years, why it was a, a great training site for physicians. Um, you know, the, uh, the hospital itself has, has gotten so much bigger. Um, but you will find the experts in everything. One of the nice things was, you know, during my early years and during the early training, we were all trained by physicians and we had... Yeah. If we needed a specialty rotation, we would find someone who would do it. I yeah. mean, we had a nurse in my class who was the uh, the nursing director of Metropolitan. So when we went to do our rotations there, she made sure everybody was on board with giving us every patient, every skill, every, you know, and that's the way it kind of got as, as it went along. Um, we've moved further away from that physician contact. And that I think is, is one of the things that's lacking in, in medic training these days. That is sad too, because when we all started as when we were all young paramedics getting training, all of our classes were taught by docs. Yeah. And we learned anatomy, we learned physiology, we learned exactly what was going on. And that's sad that that has disappeared in so many places. I mean, we used to have to go to a call review every week where the physician would sit down and we would review the calls of the week, especially in the early years. It was a great learning opportunity. Yep. You know, and it was nice because it was almost like grand rounds, right? It was. Yeah. Because it, it, it was it was based on education. Yeah. These days, there's more of a component of discipline every any time you get around to some of those discussions. Yeah. But you had a one-to-one -one contact with your physician. Yeah. Even at, at Coney Island, I mean, our medical director was the one who coordinated everything for us, from supplies to problems with the staff to training, got us into being CPR instructors for them. So we were teaching the house staff. CPR and ACLS, um, a lot, a lot tighter group than you're going to find today. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, in the city of New York now, the training of paramedics is it taking place on Staten Island or is it still in the hospitals? Uh, it's in a number of locations. You've got some private groups that do training uh, in affiliation with a the hospital. Uh, there's one group at Methodist. There used to be St. Vincent's when it was still open. Uh, they went on to train a lot of the, the paramedics that are in the system now. And most of the people that they trained tended to work for the voluntary system because, they, you, know, you know, New York City EMS had its own programs. When it went to the fire department, the fire department, we have our own academy where we do all the training. So yeah. we don't need that. But now you've got people, in, you know, coming in from the outside who kind of have to get reviewed if they want to come work for, yeah. for FDNY. So it's, uh, there's a lot more of that, a lot more choices of where to go. Some of it is good, some of it is bad. <laughs> but there, there are a couple of first rate places still that have put out a lot of good medics. Um, now, let's see. How long ago did you relocate to where you are now? 2005. Uh, my wife wanted to get out of New York after September 11th. Uh, I had already reached the maximum on my pension. So I could go any day I wanted. Um, and we just kind of did a road trip of where do we want to go and ended up in Charlotte. That was uh, her choice. My daughter liked it. They tried it for a while. And when they said, all right, we're going to stay. At that point, I took full retirement. And I came down here and I started working for Mecklenburg EMS. Cool. And so, what's different with Mecklenburg EMS as opposed to Fidney? Everything. <laughs> Everything you can think of. Um, it's an interesting system. It's a public utility model. It is run by a consortium of the county and the two major hospital systems. So they do the oversight um, of every facet uh, of, of rulemaking, of the contract, the whole deal. Um, what was different about it? We went to 12-hour tours. We went to system status 
where we were no longer assigned to a station. You would respond right. to headquarters, sign out your truck, go on the air, and they would put you at whatever post around the city, or I'm sorry, around the county, um, had a vacancy. And right. it ran basically on call goes out, that truck does the call, there's a vacancy, whoever went available now backfills somewhere in that system. Um, it was a, uh, a, a single medic system, so I was now working with an EMT most of the time. And we also had a really good first responder program. Uh, that's probably one of the highlights of, of what I think about the system. Charlotte Fire Department was very into their first responder duties. Uh, unlike FDNY, where a lot of the early ones, they didn't want anything to do with this Band-Aid stuff. Uh, that has changed a lot because of the generations that have come in. A lot of our EMTs have gone into the fire side, and that's a whole other story of them decimating our ranks to fill firefighter positions. Yep. So, but to get back to, to Mecklenburg, it was, it was a lot more challenging. You know, I had to get used to much longer transport times, less hospitals, uh, really only one major trauma center where in New York we had, you know, one per each borough. Some boroughs had two. Yep. Um, you know, if you couldn't make a trauma center in 20 minutes, that was highly unusual. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it was huge learning curve. <laughs> cool. I had to learn the Southern ways. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, very good. A Yankee. You still enjoying it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did 10 years there and I, I thought I was going to call it a day at that point. Took about five months off and I started getting bored. So at that point I said, well, I'm now getting two pensions. Financially, I'm doing all right. What do I really want to do? And I started working for Piedmont EMS uh, just over the border in South Carolina. So I'm part time there. I have a very uh, flexible scheduling arrangement and uh, a bunch of good people, but it is more rural than I have seen anywhere else in my career. Are you uh, doing much precepting and stuff like that? I'm not anymore. That's one of the things I missed. Uh, yeah. I, I did yeah. that constantly in New York. Yeah. When I came down to Medic, I started doing it because they had students from, I think it was Western Carolina University yeah. coming through. Um, and I, I like doing that, but I did not want to do the FTO position, you know, of, of, yeah. of being the guy who's teaching you the corporate rules. I wanted to teach medicine. And, Western uh, Carolina, Cullowee, right? Uh, couldn't where it's located? Yeah, that's where I've it is. seen the students and they used to do a <laughs> rotation around the state to kind of get in, you know, a little urban, a little suburban, a yep. little uh, interesting group, interesting group. I don't know how that system uh, managed to do that with efficiency, but uh, it's working for them. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Well, we have reached the bewitching hour here. Uh, well, it's been wonderful catching up with you, Mark. We haven't seen each other much in the last 10 years, but anyway, um, let's see if Christy can come back and join us. There she is. Hi, Christy. Here we go. All right. Closing thoughts you want to share with the people? Uh, well, we've had a couple of questions come through on Facebook. So okay. um, one, can you pick a highlight from your career? You run what seems to be the length and breadth of EMS experiences. Is there a memorable highlight that you'd like to share? All right, well, there were two. One of the assignments that I took in New York, which I love to do and people are, are still doing today, I was a member of the Dignitary Protection Unit, which because of the number of high-ranking foreign dignitaries, as well as the number of frequent visits from the president and vice president. I used to do those details from almost when I graduated. Uh, so that's been fascinating. You know, doing the motorcades uh, is that. The other one that's still kind of, I, I was thinking about it before. I've probably had over 200 ROSCs in my career. Um, we used to document it. I've got paperwork and commendations from all of it. But in the early days, you didn't have Mark, Mark, use an acronym. Spell out what you just meant. Okay, ROSC, Return of Spontaneous Circulation. Thank you. We used to call them saves. All right. You've you successfully resuscitated a cardiac arrest patient. 
I mean, we used to do a lot of cardiac arrests. If you didn't do at least one a week, you were doing something wrong. And I worked in a high medical area, so we got much more than that. So despite that, you know, the number of, of walk out of the hospital survivors was still low, maybe 10%. We had one on a particularly bad night under the worst circumstances, who is a survivor since 1999, who I'm still in contact with. And it kind of really starts to put things in perspective when you meet them, when you meet their family. Yep. One of the nice things that, that uh, FIDNI did um, during EMS week is we used to have the second chance breakfast where they would gather together the rescuers, including the firefighters, sometimes the medical control physician, and the patient and his family, and they would come down, we'd have breakfast together. So a year after this particular incident, which to, to give you the short version of it, we were on mandatory overtime. We were doing our third cardiac arrest of the night. This was across the street from the hospital. We get there, we're the first unit on the scene. We are the ones doing CPR and starting ALS, all right? Managed to get him tubed and a line before the first responding unit came in. The first responding unit happened to be the chief of EMS who was out on the road that night. So Chief McCracken and his aide, who was a former partner of mine, were now doing CPR for us. This guy was in refractory V-fib. We must have gotten him back about six times till finally we were down to the bottom of the drug box. We had just given him mag sulfate and it was time to transport. We had to move him standing up on a scoop stretcher in the elevator to get him down. We were up on the sixth floor. Get him downstairs, we're still doing CPR. My partner's in the back now. I'm driving, we've got our two EMTs and the other medic back there who was Chief McCracken's partner. Um, I get to the hospital, I open up the door and Bill goes, we've got a pulse again and it's sticking. We've got a blood pressure. So with that introduction to it, uh, you know, you would not think you would ever get something out of this. Complete recovery. Met him at the, uh, the second chance breakfast, met his wife, his kids. Very nice. All right. You start to think more about down the road. You know, there's a family involved here and you don't think about that often. Well, five years later, they decided to invite him back for a five year anniversary. Now his daughter is married. She's got uh, kids. Um, we're meeting a little bit of that. He's sending me photographs of the grandkids. Um, I think at that point, his wife had passed away, which was kind of strange. And you just, you know, you begin to know the whole family and you start to realize what you just did wasn't just, ah, I was proficient, okay? It is, I've got grandkids now that know a grandfather, I've got a daughter that has a father still, and he's still kicking and going strong. Very cool. He email each other. That's on, incredible. He, he calls it his rebirth. He emails me on the date of his rebirth. Isn't that cool? Just weird, you know, that one's story. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very Just cool. The other, questions? yeah, the other question was okay. along the same lines. Um, Having run the breadth of experiences, do you have any good advice for somebody just entering in now? What's, what's the best way to plot your course for a career right now? The one thing I didn't appreciate in my early years was um, my assignments. My original assignment when I started was doing six week stints, filling in for other motor vehicle operators who were going through what we called Corman trading. They were in the process of creating a unified driver and technician. So the ambulance technicians who never drove were going to driving school. The, old, the, you know, the drivers are now going for their EMT classes. So they would move me every six weeks. It was tiresome. So I got moved all around the city to every station. I spent time in the Bronx, which was like on the other side of the world for me. I'd never been there. <laughs> And, you know, you get a little bit annoyed at like, why couldn't you just put me in Brooklyn? But when you get done with it all, you realize 
every bit of that experience and, and relationship and having those partners has taught me something that I never would have gotten if I stayed in one place. Yeah. All right. I have picked up things from old time ambulance techs that taught me my trade to, you know, I've, I've had physicians in the ER teaching us stuff. Partners that I am teaching things and they say, you know, we figured out something a little bit better. What do you think about doing this? Interact with the people around you because they are going to be your best resource and have an open mind about it. You know, I tell people, and especially like new students when I was doing it, one of the things that I'm going to be able to do for you is teach you not to make the mistake that I've already made. All right. Find yourself good preceptors, people that will follow you, mentors, people that will sit there and, 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 you know, even if you're just an EMT that will sit after a call, let's review what we did here, what went well, and what didn't. You know, they're out there. There's thousands of them out there, but yep. you got to be able to look at them and say, can we talk about this? Very good. Great. Excellent. Great. Mark. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been a while since we've got to see you. So hopefully we won't keep you as a stranger for so long. And we'll get you back into the fold here at the museum once you officially retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, once EMS Today comes back to Charlotte, I'll put in another appearance. Yeah. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you, everybody who is watching on Facebook and those great questions you messaged in. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Doc. This was a great way to spend our Friday of EMS week, a wonderful way to celebrate. Um, we are off next week. It's the long weekend, so I hope everybody uh, has some fun plans and you stay safe if you're out there working. Thank you so much for spending the long weekend on shift. And then we'll see everybody again back here on June 4th for some more coffee. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful weekend.